Um, it's our regular meeting. Can I have a roll call, please? Yes, you can. <coughs> Donna Corbin Savinsky. Here. Kevin Zorda. Here. Virginia Higley. Virginia Higley, here. Uh, Robert Chagnon. Jane Smith. Carrie Ann Wagner Howe. Marie Pisner. Here. Kelly Hemler. Here. And Marcy Talisio. Here. Can we seat the alternates? Mm -hmm. Please. We'll be okay. Uh, fire ev evacuation procedures. If there's an emergency and you need to exit the building, you can go out the door to my left and down the stairs and away from the building or the, the door in the back of the room and again away from the building. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. <coughs> Next on the agenda is public participation. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak regarding items not on the agenda? Again, anybody would like to speak regarding items not on the agenda? And one last time, speak against something not on the agenda. Perfect. Uh, correspondence. So we received at our desk, um, it's a wetland decision criteria for wetlands. We have some new people, so we wanted to make sure they had that in their packets. Um, we received the credentials for Roger O'Brien, uh, Jennifer, and for Raquel. So thank you very much on those. Are, those are interesting to read. Appreciate that. We also received, uh, I think that's it. Oh, for um, some more information for, for our agenda item for the public hearing, which we'll talk about during the public hearing. Um, and that's it for correspondence. Uh, commissioner's correspondence, any site visits or anything anybody would like to no. talk about? To my nope. left? No? Nope. Perfect. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of minutes. We have December 19th and January 16th. I move to approve both sets of meetings. I second. A roll call. <coughs> Donna? Yes. Kevin? Uh, yes, for January 16th. I abstain from the uh, December 19th. I wasn't present. Okay. Virginia, yes. Um, Marie? Yes. Kelly? Okay. Make that small change and then yes, okay. okay. Um, Marcy? I also wasn't here for December 19th, but yes to January 16th. Okay, so as, as amended, I move the two sets as amended are approved. Okay, okay so motion passes. Oh, we, have to vote on it, don't we? Oh, no. we just did. Okay. <laughs> for January 16th, uh, six in favor. December 19th, I think I got four in favor and two amended, two abstain. Make a motion for yeah. All right, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, switch the order of uh, number nine, old business, with uh, number 10, new business, as uh, the uh, old business is gonna take a little bit longer. So to give the uh, new business, um, get that out of the way for those folks, I move that we switch those two. Can I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes. So we're going to, next on the agenda now will be new business, which is IW588243 Shaker Road, application for modification of wetlands permit for the construction of three additional sand towers, Yankee Casting Company Incorporated, <laughs> owner applicant, map 95, lot 6, industrial 2, I2 zone. I think I said that wrong. Yeah, I2, I2 zone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are the applicants here? Yankee Cast? Is Yankee Casting here? Guess not. Table it? Guess we'll table it for now. Right along here. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure they can I make a motion to reverse the previous motion. We'll just move to the next item, which is our public hearing. Maybe you pass over it and they might show up. Yeah, if they show up. Yes. 
they'll have to go off last. Yes. Okay, so next on the event, <laughs> the agenda <laughs> is our public hearing. Um, IW 585-0 King Street, application for provo proposed development consisting of two buildings, 500,225 500, square foot distribution building of warehouse space and office space, and 100,125 square foot flex building, DF Realty LLC owner applicant, map 16, lot 108, industrial one, I1 zone. Okay, so are they here? I think they are. <laughs> Might just know for the record that this was when this application was originally opened, uh, that it's been, uh, you've, the commission has received testimony twice already with respect to it, and there's a continuation. And for the applicants, they weren't here at our last meeting. A couple of people did speak up. Um, one of them Mike, was a resident, Michael Shaw, who talked about some clearing on the property, and there was some pile of dirt they wanted some feedback on. Roger. <laughs> um, one of the one of the residents spoke last time. The applicants weren't here, but it was about some clearing on the property that was taking place and some dirt they wanted an update on. And Karen Laplant and Gretchen, I didn't get her last name, also Pfeiffer Hall. Hall also spoke regarding um, some DEP and environmental investigations. So just that up right and I think we will provide the applicant the uh, minute your minutes that detail their comments which you just adopted so they will be up to speed on that perfect thank you okay so if you could state your name and address for the record please uh, good evening my name is Jeff board with BL companies professional <laughs> engineer in the state of Connecticut we're located at 100 Constitution Plaza in Hartford Connecticut uh, here on behalf of DL Realty LLC uh, with us tonight with DF Realty is Mark Fontaine uh, in the audience. Uh, Rachel Highland, who's our project scientist at BL Companies, responsible for the wetlands report for you this evening. And Eric Davison, who's a certified soil scientist. Um, just to give everybody a little background who wasn't here, I know a few of you weren't here at the original presentation. Um, the site is Zero King Street. I believe it's just King Street. We were calling it Zero King Street for the purpose of this application. Uh, it's Zoned I-1 industrial warehouse distribution, 135.6 acres, generally sloping from north to south, uh, discharging into Bowens Brook. Um, there are 32.6 acres of wetlands on site. Uh, and basically, as you can see from this existing conditions exhibit, which was submitted as part of the package, it's bordered to the north by Mullen Road, to the south by the town of East Windsor, Route 140, and then to the west by King Street and I-91. Um, Last time we were here, we heard a lot of comments. We, we've gotten Roger's um, comment letter, which we addressed, and we submitted a response to comment letter. Um, and coming out of that, we felt it was necessary to also reach out to the neighborhood, um, hearing the concerns at the last meeting. Uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting. We sent out all the abutters that got the notifications for the public hearing, um, an invite to come to one of the corporate offices um, to basically hear, hear them out, hear, hear what they think about the project, take some of their comments into consideration prior to resubmitting plans back to you guys. And that took place on January 11th. So we did get a lot of good feedback from that meeting. Um, and then that, accompanied by Roger's comments that we got, uh, gave us what we feel in our resubmission package is a pretty comprehensive package. Um, that uh, I'll get into right now. Um, from a site plan standpoint. I just want to say from a procedural standpoint that that was highly unusual and it really, to have a neighborhood meeting in the, in the middle of a public hearing, normally once you file an application or any, inf any dialogue that you would have with neighbors would be part of the public record. So there are some neighbors tonight who feel as though they want to present to the commission what was what they were told and what representations were made to them because, um, as I said, normally um, all correspondence, communications, and anything else in an open public hearing is part of that open public hearing and not, ta not, not uh, a separate meeting um, outside of town hall uh, that, that is not part of the public record. So 
Um, later, I, I, so I think the applicant should make part of this record anything that they, any representations they made, any promises they made to the neighbors or anything else, and the neighbors also should put on the public record any promises that they received or representations that were made uh, so that the, the record is complete. All right, with that said, um, just a brief introduction to the site plan rendering. It's a colorized version of the new site plan you guys received. Uh, from the last meeting till now, there aren't a lot of changes. Um, we made some changes, and one of the things Roger pointed out was the fact that we were looking for an interior landscaping variance, which would have required us going to ZBA. Um, we did not want to have to do that, so we went back through, revisited the parking, and in both parking lots for the proposed 100,000 square foot building and the 500,000, we were able to add um, several landscaped islands, and we now comply 100% with that criteria. Uh, so that was one of the bigger site plan changes. Um, also on this exhibit, what we have is a culmination of some of the discussions that took place at the neighborhood meeting uh, was with the additional landscaping uh, bordering the residential properties. Uh, so we went back, we did add several evergreen trees along the border to the residential, um, and we also added uh, additional landscaping next to the 500,000 square foot, and we're still remaining, or leaving those existing buffers, um, which is heavily wooded right now, remaining. Um, and we do have the 100 foot buffer that's required by code, so we've just supplemented that based on the landscape regulations which ad with additional plantings. Um, that being said, to put some of the other items on record from the neighborhood meeting, uh, one of their concerns was about lighting, which I know isn't a big wetland um, issue, but they just wanted to ensure that they're dark sky compliant, there's no light spillage, they have house side shields, um, which, which we talked about in the first meeting. Uh, and then the other thing that was not on these plans was in line with the lighting concerns, was having some sort of board on board fence essentially above the 100,000 foot, square foot building. Um, that would block truck traffic, car traffic, uh, headlights from shining through the woods and into the abutting properties. Uh, we are amenable to doing that um, along the perimeters where that would take place. So that's the only thing that was agreed to that is not on the plans before you this evening. Um, the other thing that we had done was gone back through and we hadn't made any changes to our stormwater management system or water quality structures, but I know there was means for clarification within Roger's letter. Um, I did want to walk through again and just briefly touch on what we typically do from a water quality standpoint on these sites. Um, and again, they're designed in accordance to the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual. Um, and what that means is they basically require you to remove in a proposed condition 80% of TSS removal, which is total suspended solids. Now, there's no um, criteria in the regulations that require any kind of pre-development water quality calculations to take place. So essentially what they do is have you look at it from a proposed standpoint and basically you walk through what they call a treatment train, which is a series of best management practices, uh, including sediment traps, sediment four bays, grass filter strips, deep sumps, and basically it's a calculation based on that manual that for every stormwater basin, there's nine of them, there's a calculation within the drainage report that shows you it's at or above the 80% that is required by code. So all of those were in the last drainage report. They're still in there today, and we have elaborated on it. And then to help clarify it, because I know with the amount of stuff on these plans, it is very hard to see what is actually going on from a drainage standpoint. Uh, we color-coded this exhibit um, that was also in your packages that basically has the existing stormwater management basins in a light green color. So you could see that there are, I believe, eight of them total, not nine. Um, and basically there's sediment four bays that we're showing in blue. There's grass filter strips that we're showing in the pink back here. And then we highlighted in a circle, in the orange circles, those are all the hydrodynamic separators that are also part of that treatment train. So when you walk through the drainage report, each one of those basins has that treatment train associated with it, whether it goes through a hydrodynamic separator and into a, um, a sediment four bay, or whether it goes through a grass filter strip, and all those calculations are in there, and they all meet the guidelines. Um, the one thing that is confusing in the manual, it does refer to pre-development hydraulic patterns, 
which is basically matching preverse posts um, and, and matching drainage patterns on site, which we have done. We mimicked existing drainage patterns, and in all cases, in all drainage areas, we are reducing peak flows uh, to all of them. So that's the one thing that the water quality manual does ask you to do from a pre-development standpoint, is just make sure a preverse post is matched. Uh, one of the other concerns was the, the O&M manual uh, not being detailed enough um, and not being clear enough as to some of the maintenance that's going to take place as part of the O&M process. Uh, essentially, that is also designed in accordance with this guidelines and this manual, and that was also included in the original drainage report, which basically has checklists, logs for contractors and for owner alike to clean periodically all of these different BMPs, each of which have their own cleaning schedule, each of which have their own process for it. With that said, I do want to turn it over. Um, just I know last time we didn't have Eric here who delineated the actual wetlands, uh, just to have him walk you through some of the delineation process and how he validated the actual locations of these wetlands. That's on to the next exhibit, which was just the wetland plan. Where would you like me? I'll give you this. Uh, Jeff, if you could, when you put something up there, identify what it is and also say whether it's in the packet that the commission has or whether it's an exhibit, All four of these. exhibit tonight or what exactly it is. Yep. And if it's in their packet, they could then follow along at their desk as well. Will do. So what is this? This one is the wetland impacts plan, which was included as part of your packet. Uh, good evening, my name is Eric Davison. I'm a registered soil scientist and a certified professional wetland scientist. Uh, I delineated the wetlands along with my partner, Matt Davison, my partner and my brother, who's also a soil scientist and wetland scientist. Both of us have been practicing for 18 years or so. Uh, I understand you just wanted sort of a brief description of the process of delineation, um, so I can I can do that and stop me if I'm... Well, uh, if, if I could, because it's in the letter that I sent, what I suggested was that normally the process is if you're changing the wetland delineation substantially, that you need to tell us how you arrived at that, which is time of the year, the soil samples you took, the depth of soil, what you found. So it's not like a brief presentation. This is a serious thing because you're basically saying you don't agree with the wetland map as existing and you would like this commission to, based on your testimony and presentation, change the official wetland map. Okay, so your commission has a formal wetland amendment process, a map amendment process? Yes. Okay, I was not aware of that. So uh, typically for towns that have that, they would hold that first, adopt that new wetland line, and then move into the, is that, did I miss that? Right, and so what we are okay. doing is a streamlined process, okay. and, gotcha. and but it is an important thing because if they don't accept your new wetland, sure. You don't get to the second half. Sure. Okay. No, that's understood. Yeah, I was not not, not a not a lot of towns have a formal wetland amendment map amendment process. So, but I'm familiar with it. So that I understand. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, so uh, we delineated the wetlands starting in June. Uh, we did the bulk of the work in June, uh, but we did some follow up work in September. So as you'll see uh, from the report that I submitted uh, that covers the delineation process, uh, I have. Uh, delineation dates starting at 614 and ending at September 21st. Um, but basically the process is we did what's called a, an auger and spade delineation, which means most of the, the soil analysis is done with a hand auger. That's the typical process in Connecticut in certain areas where the soils are disturbed or you want to get a sort of a more comprehensive look. We do a spade hole, which is just a, you know, typical, you know, a spade is just a narrow shovel, so it's you can basically dig a deeper, wider hole uh, and get a better understanding of the soil profile. But basically, what we do is we dig down two feet um, on a site like on a typical site in other parts of Connecticut. You might do those hole. You would basically walk along where you think the wetland boundary is, and you know that's based on topography and vegetation. And what you do is you you dig an upland hole that's not wet. You dig a wetland hole. And then you sort of start moving those holes towards each other until you get, you know, basically five or ten feet apart, and that's where you place your flag. 
um, with these soils with, in, in Enfield and a few other towns that have these glacial lacustrine soils, they're um, a little bit um, a little bit more difficult to uh, delineate, and the mostly because the topography is so um, gentle. So on a site like this, we're digging very close together, you know, five or ten feet, and that's why generally there was two of us. So we would sort of piggyback the line: one person dig here, or there. So basically, what you're doing, as I said, is you're moving along the wetland line every 10, 20 feet and, and digging across the topo sequence, as they call it, until you hit that, that wetland boundary. Um, and again, we're digging with an auger. It's a two and a half inch bucket auger. You dig down, pull out the soil core as you go down and then you investigate um, the color of the soil and uh, the um, amount of uh, what we call modeling or redoxomorphic features. Basically, the, that's what indicates the uh, seasonal depth of the water table. So you look at the soils, which in Connecticut, we're strictly a soils criteria based um, uh, state. Uh, most of the other states around us look at vegetation, soils, and hydrology. Um, but on a site like this, we would tend to also try to lean on those other aspects that everybody looks at, the vegetation and the hydrology, um, to help weigh in on the line. And let me explain what I mean by that. On a site like this, you might be in an area where you can clearly see there's seasonal ponding, but the soils might be bright. They might be good soils. We would generally take that area and we would move the line up and lump that in. So um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is on a site like this with these soils, you tend to be conservative about the line. In other words, you flag more wetlands than you would um, because these soils are, are a little bit more difficult and they're a little bit, you know, just mostly because of the topography. Um, we did have the uh, benefit of having a previously delineated line on this site by Ed Pollock, and it, the flags were not that old, so we were able to sort of follow some of that old line. We did actually expand the wetlands in a number of areas that he flagged where we thought his line was what we would call too aggressive, in other words, too, too far in. So our, our wetland boundary ended up being further up the slope and a larger acreage of wetlands across the site because of that. Um, Part of it, we think, was due to just the dense brush, and it's it's difficult when there's one person because you can't you can't move as easily. So if you have two people, you can kind of it's just easier to maneuver and fine tune that line. Um, but uh, most of the wetlands uh, were pretty straightforward, aside from the issues of the brush and the relatively gentle topography. The the difficult wetland was the one in the center there that um, it looks like the parking lot sits over that that climbs up into that field. That's, that's a wetland that you know we sort of call a soil scientist wetland. Most people would never notice a wetland like that. There's no indicators of surface hydrology because it's farmed. And the vegetation, there's some wetland vegetation in there, but it includes a lot of upland species. So it's not, if you walk through that, you would not notice that wetland. But we saw a sort of a gentle swale there. Um, and we had some, again, some indications for some old flagging in that area. And we were able to, to remap that. And again, it was a little bit are a little bit larger than what the previous soil scientists had mapped. Um, we did adopt some of the old wetland line if we had, because you know they had some survey and had some old information about that. So if we found those old flags and we thought the line was correct, we just hung our flag on that, that previous delineated line. And that's sort of the industry standard. You don't disagree with another soil scientist unless you have a real reason to. So if we saw his flag was accurate, we just sort of refreshed the flag, we put up a new flag, and then re had it resurveyed. Um, I'm not sure what else you might want to know. Can you characterize the amount of wetlands, the, the extent of the reduction in wetlands, the overall extent? What, what percentage of the site was wetland, and what, how much did you reduce it? I, I can answer that. Um, there was actually 2.39 acres of wetland disturbance. Uh, Talking about the boundaries of the wetlands, not what you disturb, but you've actually reduced the reduced the amount of wetlands from the uh, official official map. So what you're as, what you're saying to this board is we would like you to accept that the boundary that the amount of wetlands is less than the map, and Are you so. So that's what that's, yeah, that's I, I can, basically what, what you're going to have to say. I can explain that. Yeah. So, so you, I'm assuming that the, the town wetland mapping is an adoption of the NRCS soil soil mapping. For the and, most in, part. A, in other words, that you didn't have someone go through the town and do a full town townwide delineation. 
I say that because there's there's a couple of towns in Fairfield County that have done that. So um, that I, that's why I ask. So the NRCS soil mapping, nine times out of ten, when you flag uh, a site that has a wetland distributed uh, on the map from the NRCS soil mapping like this, you will reduce the size. Um, but you also will make certain connections between wetlands that um, that they don't, they don't make, and you'll see that from from this mapping. So they have a wet, they have some wetland areas on. The, I'm looking at the the map now, and I believe this is probably submitted. But um, some areas are smaller. Um, but I, I'm not sure we could calculate that. But it looks like we may have actually increased the the extent of the wetlands from the NRCS soil mapping. Just just a visual analysis here. What I'm looking at now. Um, the Do you have something as an overlay that shows both? No. No, I tried to get the shape file um, off the GIS on Enfield uh, website, and I even called the IT guy, and he said that that was not available currently. We, we, I mean, if 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 it turns out that this is in fact an adoption of the NRCS mapping, that is digitally available, and we could do that. But j just looking at that, and we could pass this around if you don't have that. Um, I can I just walk you through it, but that certainly the western wetland. I have a quick question on this um, that, that you're discussing. Um, it shows the wetland boundary as kind of a pinkish solid line, and then you have the wetlands direct impact area, then you have purple wetlands buffer impact area, and then you have the hashtag yeah. wetlands creation area. Yeah, yes. Right. Well, I see on here you have dotted lines, and they're kind of a bluish green. They have wetland buffers. Buffer. And they're kind of like all over the map. Is that the upland? It's the upland review area, 100 foot buffer. Okay, thank you. But just looking at this figure, which I think Rachel's going to submit here, the western wetland, which we mapped all the way to the west side where that road comes in, certainly we've mapped that to a greater extent than what's on the official mapping. We can share. Um, yeah, we can share. The next wetland over to the east uh, it looks to be slightly smaller. Then the, the wetland in the center of the field, it looks slightly smaller. But the wetlands to the far east and southeast uh, look to be more extensive. Um, I'm sorry, is this what you handed out what y your? No, um, that's the, the OK. Yeah, right. but, but again, generally speaking, the NRCS mapping is not, it, it's not intended to be site specific, and it almost it, it, I shouldn't say almost never, it never matches what you find in the field. It's intended to be a desktop review, and if you dig into the literature about how they created it and the cautions about how to use it, they, it's based on very little field work. They really just look at topographic maps and the location of the state and look at the geology of the area, uh, and they basically draw these wetland polygons based on the USGS topographic maps, which are at a scale of 1 to 12,000. Uh, so it's... It, when you get down to this scale, to the site-specific scale, uh, they're not intended to be accurate. They're intended to give you sort of a ballpark of what might be there. And that's, thankfully, the, what keeps me in, in business. Um, so it requires that you go out and do a field survey. But I'm sure you've had other applications that, you know, you've seen this where the lines don't look exactly like the NRCS map. But in this case, they're, the extent is actually relatively similar. Yeah, and that's why what we're trying to get into the record and provide sure. is yeah. that you you need to indicate so in those areas where you said it was less, that's why we asked you like yeah. and I don't sometimes what we get is we actually get a map where you did your where you did your show, your your auger samples from and how you came to your conclusion. So in yeah. the absence of that it's your representation that it wasn't wet when you found it in the field, but if you don't submit anything to the commission, how do they make the decision? Sure. Uh, on a site like this that's over 100 acres, I mean, if I, if I were to show you a map of where we dug holes, it would be, you'd basically be covering all points of the wetland boundary that we, you see here in front of you would be holes all up and down and all over that line. I mean, like I said, we're, if the linear feet of the wetlands we've mapped significant and we've digging, you know, three or four holes around each flag, and every flag is 10, 20, 30 feet apart. So it, it, this is a lot, a, lot of, a lot of digging. This is an intensive soil survey. This is, this, I don't think we've ever spent this much time on a site of this size. Um, 
I could. But you don't have any boring logs or or sample logs or anything else or map or records or anything you can submit other than telling us that that's what you did. The requirements in Connecticut for delineation don't require that you submit soil uh, logs or profiles of the soil. We can certainly do that. We certainly look at that in the field. Uh, every time we dig a hole, we're looking at the profile from the top to the bottom, from the from the top soil down to two feet. We look at the profile. Uh, we check the color book. Um, if it meets the wetland criteria, then we consider it wet. You don't record that information uh, unless someone's asking for it. And the only regulatory agency that requires that is the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and even that, for a full wetland, they only require you know that you submit a few borings across a, what they call you know a, a transect. Um, we could certainly provide that information. I simply have to go back out on the field and dig up and down from the wetland boundary, not not to be flipped, but I don't know that it would mean anything to you if you were reading it. Um, but um, it's just not something that we actually collect and write down. It's not, that's not required by the state. It's not required by any of the towns. It is the protocol of this commission, uh, and we can go back years and what's in the files and is what the commission is used to receiving. So you want to see... And this is one of the larger sites in town. So I'm, you know, I, not to be flip either, but it's what the, this commission is used to receiving. Yeah, you do have something. It, yeah, if that's, I, I, I was not aware that that was a requirement of the commission for a, a map amendment. Um, again, the towns that I've done to have a formal map amendment process, they don't ask for soil um, profile descriptions. But if that's obviously if that's something that you require and you, I'm they want. I think there see. needs to be a report from you that says what, how did you reach your conclusions. I, I did. That, that provides enough information that's in the record, and all we have so far is a verbal description. I did submit a delineation report. Um, I assume that that ended up in your in your packet. It's included in the wetland report. It has the. Appendix. It's, I've got a copy of it here, but... So maybe you the, might have wanted to then go through that report as part of tonight's Sure, I, I think I've been covering that uh, here, but basically it's a... This is a report that's fairly standard in the industry and I use in all of the towns that I work in. Um, it has the date of work, has the location of the work, um, it has the uh, type of wetlands that were identified, the cover types, um, so we're indicating that uh, there are intermittent streams present, there are perennial streams present. There are inland wetlands present. Uh, these are all boxes that are checked in the report. Uh, the identification method is shown here. It's listed as auger and spade. Um, the numbering sequences of the flagging you have on the site plan. Um, we have a listing of the wetland plant communities as forested, sapling shrub. It's Appendix B if you're looking for it, I'm sorry. It's Appendix B, B she's saying. Roger. I'm confused. This is a public hearing for um, modification of a wetlands permit. And now we're talking about um, modification of wetlands. Wouldn't that be something that would need to be either re-advertised or, or amended? With no, what we have? Well, Commissioner, what it is is um, you could have had a separate public hearing first on just the question of whether you agreed with the wetland boundaries. Sometimes you have done that. Other times, um, if uh, the, the commission has, when you're holding a public hearing, because you don't hold a public hearing on every application. And so when you didn't that. have a public hearing on it, you, you did it. And if they were amending the wetland map, you, you had a public hearing on that. I think that what we have now is we have a public hearing on this application and they, and and in reviewing it, it's been determined that they made changes in the wetland boundary and I agree with the applicant that we expect changes in the wetland boundary and all we were doing is making sure the applicant entered into the record how they did that. And so now he has pointed out in the record something he submitted that he's now He's now appeared, and you can ask him questions about. Right. So it may well be that you have the documentation in front of you, and at this point, it would be appropriate if any of the commissioners wanted to question him about it. Um, so I think you're good. Okay, but if if it if we as a group decide to approve this along with the wetlands changes, 
would that be in the conditions of approval so that it would be clear to anyone in going forward? And if you adopted this without changing the where the boundary is, then you do, in effect, have amended the map. Thank you. But j just to clarify, uh, I, I think now you see that I have a delineation report in the file. and. and um, what that includes and what that typically includes is a description of the regulatory requirements for delineation. I have that in here. In other words, it explains w what are we looking for, we're, what soil types are we looking for, and what are we requir required to map based on uh, state statute, and that's listed in the report. The wetland types we found are listed in the report. And mo oh, that's why. That's why. That's why we don't have it. Can't it. Yeah, it, it was too big to make oh, all the copies of Sorry. <laughs> sorry, we sent it in an email. Oh, I have another one if you want another copy. Just look at it. Here, you can. You want this one too? I would have liked to have studied it before the meeting, and it's you not can your take fault. This too. But I'm just saying. They got the commission got your report electronically, so that's why we've just taken care of that. <laughs> Thank you. Just definitions. But as I was saying, it, in, it includes the regulatory guidance that we follow in order to flag the wetlands, and then most importantly, in the back two pages, it includes uh, the soil types that are identified on the site, both the wetland soil types and the upland soil types. And in, under the uh, discussion of the wetland soil types, you'll see a little paragraph for each soil type. Um, and that describes um, the or origin of the wetland soil, uh, what the typical profile looks like, uh, what the you know typical depth of modeling and high water is, that there's a, there's, a, there's a discussion about each of the wetland soils that we found on the property. Sure. Uh, it's not a specific, it doesn't include, you know, here at flag 73, we found modeling at 23 inches. It's, it's not that. And again, that's not something we typically submit for a local application. Um, it's what we're in, the intention is to identify what wetland soil it is and then map the boundary of that wetland soil. Um, and that's what the, what the report summarizes. Um, again, that's a pretty standard report. Um, it, most soil scientists use some form of that or another. There's no industry form that we have, but everybody sort of looks similar to that. And um, like, like you folks, I sit on my wetland commission, and that's the report that I look for when someone comes in front of, our, in front of my commission. So. Yeah, I remember seeing it. I just didn't print it. <laughs> yeah. And just so you know, there are two soil reports there. There's the original that Ed Pollock had delineated, and then um, on top of that one should be his delineation, which, again, is the more conservative, meaning larger wetlands. If I could just ask if you remember, because it's being recorded, is before you speak, just identify yourself for the record. That was Rachel Highland. <laughs> Do you know what it was and what it is now, the difference? In, in acreage? Um, we could certainly, we can certainly get that information. That's not, that's not difficult to do. Uh, just looking again, just looking visually at it, I would say um, I would expect it's either reduced or very similar. In other words, that we have slightly more wetlands or it's, or it's matching. Um, because I'm just looking at that eastern side and southwest corner, there's a whole area uh, that's left out. And again, if you look at this map that I think Rachel said was submitted in your packet, this will show you sort of the, um, the uh, inherent <coughs> inaccuracy at the site scale of these NRCS soil maps. I mean, if you look at, they have the NRCS mapping, your official mapping overlaid onto an air photo. You can see streams and, and, wet, and wetland areas, obvious wetland areas that are not shown as wet on the NRCS mapping. So again, it's not intended to be used. It, it, it's intended to be a starting point for towns to then 
go through this process, yeah. While everybody's digesting that, I have one question um, that deals with um, the staging of the buildings. Are you, are you proposing for wetlands purposes to do the uh, larger building first and then the smaller building? We don't owe it this time. Ah. Depends on which tenants come in. Okay. Thank you. And I didn't know any... I don't remember seeing the snow piles or anything. The snow piles and where they designated, designated areas for snow piles. I know we had met with, with Roger a long time ago, and what we had done was we put oversized islands in all the parking lots. They're basically two cars wide as opposed to one. Uh, we were using that as snow storage, and we had done our plantings as such that you could push snow to the perimeter of certain parking areas. What about the roads, though? Where will you stockpile the snow on the, the road and the driveway that you're creating? They would either be pushed to the side or, or trucked off to another location if, if it was that much snow. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> now, Mr. Kabibbo's um, email we received on January 24th <clears throat> mentions about the driveways could be reduced? Uh, I, I spoke with John about the driveways on the phone. Um, I don't know if that email came to us or not, mm. if it came to the commission. But regardless, we spoke about it. And the roads are basically 32 feet wide, right. which seems large. But when you look at it, it's really only two 12-foot lanes with a four-foot shoulder, which is very, very typical of a site this size. Uh, and put it in perspective, corporate road that comes in here is actually 38 feet wide. So we've actually necked down the driveway at that location where the connection is. So it's a, it's a standard driveway that's coming in with two 12-foot lanes. Well, the public road is only 30 feet wide. I don't know. Is this? Are we going to flip this to be a town road? No, it's going to be a private road. I, I know, but I don't know why a private road would need to be wider than a public road. Hmm. And on a public road, you'd have parking spaces. And this is basically a driveway. I don't know anybody that would park along it. So that was John's point, is that on a on a environmental sensitive site, wouldn't we want to reduce the amount of imper impervious pavement? I mean, we, we are fully compliant with the impervious regulations from a town standpoint. And basically, we design several of these throughout the country. And, and this is the minimum driveway width that we use for to attract tenants to come into sites like this. If it gets too small, they're hesitant to come in from a marketing standpoint. So we do leave it like this and just have the four foot shoulder. It's not wide enough for cars to park along, um, but it does give you that safety of having a wider lane. But if the commission wanted you to reduce it, would you be amenable to that? Yes, yes we would. I know you guys are still reviewing this information, but whenever you have digested it enough and you want us to move on to the impacts and the wetland mitigation, please just let me know. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. 
And while Rachel's coming up, one of the big things we were missing at the last meeting was mitigation areas of wetlands. And we had showed some potential locations at a one to one number. We went back, we revisited it because we understand it's a big deal. And the 2.4 acres of wetlands that we are disturbing, we're now putting back pretty much two to one and over five acres of wetlands, which we have located and we have added a set of plans um, to the package that basically shows the planting, shows what we're doing, which Rachel will get into. Uh, Rachel Highland from BL Companies. Um, so just to go over, um, I know some of you were not here, but I think most of you were, so I don't want to spend a lot of time going through every single one. If you have questions, please let me know. Um, so there are eight wetlands on site. They're essentially interconnected in some way, shape, or form, um, and we kind of divided it up into three separate sections of impact. The uh, western wetland here is one area of impact. Kind of the central portion is the second area of impact, and the eastern portion is the third. Um, and we have all the impact numbers broken down um, in the wetland report. And like I said, I, I'm not going to go and point out every single area, but I'll kind of breeze through them. Um, for our area one, which is this wetland um, complex over here, we've got a total of 102,000 square feet and 45, um, 102. <laughs> 1,045 square feet, which um, is, oh, that's direct impacts for the entire site, I'm sorry. Um, for area one, it's 65,476, which is about 1.5 acres. Um, it's worth pointing out that this area right here is very heavy with invasives. Like I said last time, autumn olive, honeysuckle, um, and species such as that. Um, it does cut into the wetland a bit. Um, this wetland is forested with an emergent understory. As you move towards the center, it's mostly emergent. Um, the edges, for the most part, are forested. Um, the driveway comes through here, um, so it's going to impact that area. We are proposing a box culvert to uh, maintain the hydraulic flows that are currently um, going through there as it does become channelized through a portion, a uh, more central portion. Um, so we didn't want to block the flows from getting to that wetland. So um, we also have the mitigation plan as well as a planting plan that I'll go over afterwards. Um, but we, do, we are going to be planting those areas to try and provide some protection, um, restore some of the plants, restore the shade, um, and restore the functions and values. So our area two is the largest impact. Um, and that is a total of 182, uh, 100, I'm sorry. 190 square feet to wetland three and 53,319 square feet to wetland four. So that's these central areas. Um, it's very important to understand that this wetland is a farm field currently. And like um, Eric had pointed out, it's a soil scientist farm field. So it's not, it doesn't look like a wetland. You're not gonna step on it and feel the water come up. It, but it has the characteristics required to meet the wetland standard. Um, it's been farmed for many years now. I don't have an exact number, but it's not functioning in the same way that a normal wetland that you would stumble upon in a forest is. Um, and as a result, I would classify it as a lower quality wetland. Um, so out of all the wetlands on site, this is the best one we could be impacting. Um, as a wetland scientist, it's sad to say that, but um, if you had to choose one to impact, this would be the one to impact. Um, so then moving on as you move east, we've got a lot of upland review area impacts as the, um, the stormwater basins over here are close to the wetland. Um, so again, uh, as Jeff had mentioned, we've got a total of 2.39 acres of impact. And what we're doing now is we're going to put back over two, uh, two to one ratio. So I believe we have 5.5 acres of wetland creation proposed. Um, and we've proposed them in areas that make sense. So, We've got wetlands here and upland here. We're proposing to turn that all into wetland um, to create you know, a cohesive wetland system. Same with down here. Um, this is all just upland area. So we'll be proposing wetlands to fill those areas. Um, and what we've done also is try to replace what's already on site. So this is largely an emergent herbaceous wetland. So I've proposed emergent wetlands for the central portion of here 
through the, the central portions in this area and here. So the edges are all going to be forested to match in with the existing, because this is all forested down here. This is all forested. So the edges will be forested, and the centers will be emergent. Uh, that's the plan with the planting. Um, so. Excuse me. So I'm a little confused. You, you have it delineated on this wetlands impact map as a wetland, but you're saying you're creating a wetland. No, I'm sorry. So the, this is um, our wetland impact plan, yes. Yeah. So um, we've got the wetlands outlined in purple. OK. And then um, the impacted areas, our direct impacts are in red. Well, the, it says uh, wetland boundary is in the red or reddish pink or yep. whatever. Okay. Yep, so the, these are all the wetlands, everything inside of the, right. the pink or purpley color is the wetland. The red areas are the areas that will be directly impacted. Um, the blue areas are the direct impacts to upland review areas. And then there's a hatch, the, the striped yep. line, that is showing where we're going to create the wetlands. Okay. So oh, created. okay. So this yeah. is the wetland. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, sometimes okay. if yep. you yep. don't have a... If you don't have a reference, it looks like that's yep. already wetland. Yep. Um, yeah, so that's, okay. that's the plan. Um, I double-checked the regulations. It oh, doesn't seem yeah. that yeah. Enfield has a standard um, wetland creation ratio. So we wanted to put forth as much as we could as far as wetland creation. Um, I know last time we had mentioned a one-to-one, -one, and a lot of people on the commission seemed amenable to that. We wanted to provide more. Where is the... Um, <laughs> so just to quickly go through some of the mitigation plans, all of the wetland creation areas will be seeded with a wetland seed mix. Um, and then they'll be planted, like I said, forested edges with um, shrubs uh, towards the middle. And then the emergent um, vegetation will take hold once those seeds set. Um, some of the species that we've provided were Eastern Cottonwood, Swamp White Oak, and American Elm. And then our <laughs> shrubs include Silky Dogwood, Gray Dogwood, Winterberry, Spicebush, Meadowsweet, Highbush Blueberry, and Northern Arrowwood. I think that these species are going to be really, really good for the site. They'll provide a lot of food for animals. They'll provide a lot of shelter and habitat. Um, so that's why those were chosen. I believe we went over them last time as well, um, and the commission liked them, I think I added a couple more just to spice things up a bit and provide a little more diversity. So if you have any questions about that, feel free. How long would you say it would take for that to take hold and to actual function as a effective? It could take several years. Um, What's several to you? Uh, Ten I'd years? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Eric, what, what would you think? Can you guys just press the button on the microphone? Yep, there you go. Um, so, you, so it depends on what your cover type is. If it's an emergent wetland, um, that would that would look basically like you wanted to look after the end of the second growing season, so construction season, then a set full growing season. If it's shrub, you're, that's going to take three to five years. If it's forest, that's, you know, that's going to take as long as it takes to develop a forest from whatever plant stock you use, so you're talking 10 plus years. Right, because okay. you're talking cottonwood and, and yeah. um, my degrees in landscape design as well, so okay. I'm thinking it's going to take yeah, a while. Yeah. The emergent, like I said, we're going to seed the whole thing, so at least it should, the, the herbaceous plants should take pretty fast and within the first couple of years. Um, but yeah, the, the forest is going to take a while to develop, and that's another reason why we didn't plan the whole thing to be forest. I think that that would just take too long, mm -hmm. and we wanted to get it back to functioning as soon as possible. I know the other question I had, uh, John had, 
was about if you're going to bring in any fill from offsite. Where they there? Uh, we can provide a cut fill analysis if need be. The site is relatively flat, um, so there's not a lot of topography going on. So chances are it'll be close to a, a balanced site um, from a financial standpoint. That's what we try and do on all of these sites. It's usually when we have the extreme topography that we end up having to truck some in just to create the flat pad. So you probably won't be? There probably will not be. This might have been covered, and if it is, I apologize if I missed it. But the um, one paragraph from our um, assistant town engineer says he's discussing details submitted for the proposed wetlands crossing for the proposed driveways. And he's asking, is there the detail proposed to be used for this application? Um, uh, wait a minute. Details for these proposed wetlands crossings, and he's talking about the two driveways, should be submitted. Have they been submitted? Uh, they, they have not. A lot of times what we do is we call them out as, as the box culvert that they're going to be, and then when we go to construction documents, we do submit the structural designs of these box culverts. If we need something sooner, yeah. we could have a structural engineer you know, we've, develop we've, those yeah. ahead of time. No so. reflection on you, but we've had some issues where things have been supposed to be generated Understood. and, and you know, it gets very busy at certain yeah. times and it doesn't happen or we're not told about it, so we don't know about it. And we can provide those too. They're pretty standard box culverts, so we yeah, could provide that details. I would like to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, for this, um, go back to my sheet. So we have to have um, a decision, close the public hearing today, unless we get an, ex actually, unless we get an extension. Uh, uh, Did you no, check No, actually, records? that's what Jen and I were just okay, looking good. through. And Didn't seem um, right. you opened the public hearing two meetings ago, um, and so the applicant did grant you a 35-day extension to okay. complete the public hearing. And so you had 35 days to start with. You got 35 days added on. So you we don't have to complete the public hearing until February 27th. That's what I thought. So you have okay. a meeting on February 20th. So you can continue this public hearing till the 20th if that's Join what you meeting. want to okay. do. That's what I thought. Um, I didn't think 123 looked right. <laughs> yeah. OK, so our public hearing would has to end by our next meeting or 227. And then once you close it, you have 65 days. To make a decision. But hopefully the applicant <clears throat> will have gotten you everything by the, by the. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's just and they, be And every, all of those items requested would have to be in uh, 10 days ahead of time. Mm -hmm. yes. So you would need information submitted by uh, February 10th. So that isn't going to work. February 14th. Yeah, because in February 10th, like right around the corner. I don't know what's today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's probably like the 14th or something. But, you know, you yeah. you haven't gone to the public yet tonight. Yeah. We still have other, right. other we still questions have other things to talk and about, yeah. other things to talk about. So yeah. you have time on that. And, and then again, after we close the public hearing, then we have 65 days to make a decision. But then we can't take any more yeah. testimony yeah. or yeah. anything else. Saying. Well, you you. The public and the applicant can't submit anything f further, but you can ask your staff, staff for uh, <coughs> follow-up and provide you answers. Yeah. So that's what there. Do you have anything more? No, no. I'm all set. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? Mm -hmm. So um, be there, um, are we are we done? We have, uh, I have some, some follow-up to my report, if it's all right. If okay, I, and then we'll go to so the public after. So what the applicant keeps saying is that uh, they followed the 2004 stormwater uh, management guidelines. Um, and the stormwater management guidelines are exactly what they say. They're, they're stormwater management guidelines. They're not criteria for wetland decisions. So what I provided the commission with tonight 
and um, I just want to read them into the record and give the applicant the opportunity to address them. But the um, the stormwater management guidelines talk about minimum standards to deal with stormwater. Uh, that's whether you have wetlands or you don't have wetlands. If you go to uh, the criteria for decisions right out of the infield in on wetland regulations, it says that the criteria for decisions 10.2A includes the environmental impact of the post regulated activities on wetlands or water courses. Um, the relationship between the short-term and long-term impacts of the proposed regulated activity on wetlands or watercourses and the maintenance and enhancement of long-term productivity of such wetlands or watercourses. It also talks about minimizing pollution or other environmental damage. It talks about the impact on downstream watercourses and wetlands. And so questions that I have raised that the applicant says they don't have to provide, I don't know why they, they don't need to provide them because they can't, they can't uh, fold their tent under 2004 stormwater uh, management guidelines because your criteria, you are to look at those things. So when I say we have no idea what the quality of the stormwater is now, and we have no idea what the quality of that stormwater is going to be after they develop. All we know is this. They say in the stormwater management guideline, well, the minimum standard is we take out X amount of pollutants that are the result of what they're going to do. We don't know what the starting point is. We don't know what amount of pollutants are then entered into uh, the wetlands. And as you know, their drainage all goes right down and into this wetland area and continues on downstream into the flood area. So if we sort of start and say that uh, we're starting and we're adding 200% uh, uh, degradation, but not to worry because we're taking 50% out, we still got 150% degradation. And so we we really need, if, if there's, Commission is going to exercise the, the criteria for decision here. You have a right to ask, go take some water samples and tell us what the quality of the water going into the wetland is right now. And then tell us what you, all of that roof area of 600,000 square feet and all of the, all of the uh, impervious surface that you're putting there, what is that going to end up doing uh, to the water flow before you treat it with your stormwater management, best management practices, and then what are we going to end up with? Because if you are ending up with pollution and irretrievable results downstream, that's within your jurisdiction. Um, and the second thing is that the uh, applicant has maintained, well, there's no alternatives to what I'm doing because it wouldn't be economically feasible. There's nothing in the record that would indicate why that is so at all. And what the uh, regulations clearly say is that um, you evaluate the uh, prudent feasible alternatives. Um, so. One of the things we suggested is, do we need 600,000 square feet of, of buildings there, or is the carrying capacity of that land such that that's beyond the carrying capacity? Um, I don't think we start with any notion that just because the zoning would allow you to build 600,000 square feet, that the environmental capacity and of the of the of the land would accommodate 600,000 square feet. So if we were to reduce the size of the building a little bit, reduce the size of the parking, we wouldn't have parking that's on uh, sitting over wetlands. And you know, it's kind of interesting because as the soil scientist said, wetlands are based on soil type. So uh, soil, soils are soils. So how do you say that, well, this is a low quality soil or a low quality wetland or really not a functioning wetland? Uh, because 
if the soil type is wetland, it's wetland. So I don't understand this. Some wetlands are better than other wetlands. It's wetland is a wetland in the criteria of the state statute and in your regulation. And they're paving it over, and it doesn't have to be. I'm fine with we got to have a wetland crossing to get into the site. And then we got developable land. But I don't understand how we can then say that, well, you got this wetland here, but it's low, low quality, so we're just going to pave it over. Um, and I, so that's, that's why that the board is here to evaluate that, uh, to hear all those facts. So um, I gave you the criteria for your decision making right under your regulation, section 10. I've quoted three sections of them. Um, and, you know, as far as we need 32 feet in order to attract a company to move in there, they're not going to move in if the roadway is 30 feet. So um, I just want to enter the criteria for decision making on, onto, the, um, onto the site. From from planning standpoint, we feel that um, this site could be developed. We'd love to see it developed, but we're not quite sure that the intent, the the um, what is presently designed, can be accommodated in an environmentally sensitive manner, in a manner that does not result in irretrievable uh, loss of resources. I can respond to some of those elements as far as the, the pre-development water quality goes and the reason why the water quality manual doesn't ask you to test for pollutants up front. It's because basically when we match existing and, and post-drainage patterns and we reduce peak flows going to those drainage patterns, that right there, there's going to be less flow going to the end point. On top of that, with when you add the treatment trains, you add the outlet control structures, you add the TSS removal. It doesn't matter where you're starting from, only because you're starting at a baseline and whatever's coming to that site now is not being treated by any BMP measures or any stormwater um, control measures. So that's why they don't ask you to do any testing up front, only because you're always improving upon the situation. Yeah, we can't. We don't do that. Can't do that. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, he's, I don't agree with what he's saying either, but I'm going to let him speak. Well, as a profession, <laughs> I respectfully dis like disagree. I'm a professional engineer. I've been a professional engineer for 15 years. I know how to do drainage calculations. Um, this is going to be significantly improved regardless of the development that's going in and the truck traffic. They're all designed, all of these BMPs are designed to handle that traffic, and they're routed through conveyance systems that ultimately make it through all of these water quality measures. That's the reason why in any project we've ever done in Connecticut, we, or Massachusetts, anywhere, we haven't done, because there's no way to test the pre-development water quality compared to the proposed water quality structures. It's just reducing it that 80%. It'll be 80% better than it is today. Well, no, it doesn't say it's 80% better than it is today. It does not what it says. It says you're removing 80% of whatever is coming through there after your development. And so you might have added 200% of bad element, say, just to be simple. Okay, like oh, run off from the roof, run off from the, from the parking lot, salt, debris, what have you. And 80% of what you created plus what was there at the beginning, you're treating. But we don't know if the impact that you've put there before you start and treat it is too much for this site. So from our standpoint, then, I guess in the past, and we've had projects from a wetland standpoint, what kind of studies or tests are you making applicants go through to do the testing and test it against these pollutants? 
provide some provide to the board some assurance that they can meet their responsibilities under their decision criteria in that what you are doing is you're not making making uh, the water that's ended up in the in the in the uh, storm water in the wetland and going downstream such that it's going to cause irretrievable and harmful effects going downstream and it seems to me that you ought to know what it is now we can go out there and test it we can all go get the little kits and test it know what it is we all have the measuring of how you measure water quality it's, you know you could have that done in a day and then okay tell us all the stuff that's going to go on on that site that you're reducing by 80 percent and then provide some professional judgment as to what the quality is going into the water you haven't told us that it's just something we've never been asked to do before on any wetlands application um, and like i said when you follow the <coughs> connecticut guidelines that's that's what you follow it wouldn't even be possible to test these were technic systems, these pollutants in a proposed condition prior to even building the site. Mm. So that, that's the regulations, that's what we followed, that's an engineering project that we've done. If I understand what Roger is saying, um, right now it's undisturbed wetlands and it does, it does get cleaned to some degree by the natural right. flow through uh, vegetation and, and little, little um, vernal pools and that kind of thing but once that's gone and you've not you but uh, wetlands have been paved over in any manner that increases the flow yep. and then it also increases if you salt uh, or use any chemicals in your uh, paving sure. areas that increases the um, flow into the um, downstream so I think that that's that's what I'm taking away from what Roger is saying and and that is our concern yeah you can estimate it you can estimate pounds of sand you know, pounds of salt you can es estimate the grit from roof shingles you can est you can you can come up with an estimate of all of the stuff that's gonna that's dumping in, in onto that site and washing down and because all that we are told here is whatever that is we're going to get rid of whatever well maybe that 20 percent is going to be harmful we ought to have some sense of that and i don't think it's that hard to do no and then it would be on the record so that if anything else was getting into the uh, water um, table we would have a means to um, address it we can certainly look into doing water quality uh, testing from a preliminary standpoint it's not to say that from a proposed standpoint we'd be able to accurately compare even by estimation um, so it would still be improved upon what's there. Yeah, I can understand what yeah. you're saying. Um, it's Roger's just, I well. think, mostly the flow and the use of any additional chemicals. Like if you use a landscaper who uses some kind of salt um, mixture, that would be going into the water table, you know, downstream. Yeah, fertilizers, but also just the use of the trucks and the parking for how many hundred vehicles? Yeah. 333 car spaces for the flex building or the, the distribution building 164. and uh, yeah 164 for the flex building is that is that include the truck no. spot that does that's that's the parking space that's the park and that's for town regulations how many um, truck spots I know I saw it but 130 or something was it yeah that sounds about right So 191 on the 500,000 square foot building and 46 on the smaller 100,000 square foot building. Okay. Would they be there all the time or they're just coming and going? Coming and going. They're coming right? and going, right? Yeah. It depends on the use. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> That's a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. All right. My concern is, um, and Roger partially addressed this, he says it much better than me, but my concern is usually we have a, uh, all, a second 
alternate type, you know, like if, if, if this is considered too big, right. um, would you consider this? And that's why I asked which one was being um, built first, because it has an impact on the total property. So um, it would be helpful um, if it could be looked at and possibly um, scale back. I, this is just my feeling. I don't speak for the commission, but possibly scale back or possibly start with the smaller ones, see how that works, and then come back for a bigger one. And I know from our standpoint, the last meeting we did go through some prudent and feasible alternatives that were entered into record. And a lot of the, when we had met last year, um, we actually had this building and we kind of went through iterations. This building they wanted to have over in this area. Um, and at the guidance of planning, at the discussion of our, we did move it up here. Um, this was a larger building. Uh, we did come down and we did shrink that to the 100,000 square foot. Um, I believe it was 120, 150 before. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't right. in the greatest but you position. Only, did you have both buildings last time or just one building last we did time? it was just a different configuration which was an alternate to this but we've always had the two okay thank you it's, it's not to say if one tenant were to come into one of these spaces the other one may not come in for a little bit of time we just don't know yet are we ready for the public then yes okay Excuse me. Sure. Can I just address one of the comments regarding um, the wetlands? So when we say functions and values of a wetland, um, these are are described in the Army Corps Highway Methodology Book, which goes over 13 functions and values of wetlands, and it's how we classify them. Um, it's not completely random. Um, I'll go through them really quickly. They include groundwater recharge, uh, recharge and discharge, flood flow alteration, fish and shellfish, habitat, sediment, toxicant retention, nutrient removal, retention, and transformation, product export, sediment, shoreline stabilization, wildlife habitat, recreation, education, scientific value, uniqueness and heritage, visual quality and aesthetic and habitat for threatened or endangered species. So we do look at this when we're doing a habitat, ass a wild, uh, wetland habitat assessment. Um, and so in the report, uh, do touch on these a little bit for each of the, the eight wetlands. Um, because they're interconnected, you know, a lot of the, the functions and values kind of spread out throughout them. When we say that the middle um, field wetland is lower quality, it's because it doesn't have the lush ground cover you see in an emergent wetland that's just got mats of different herbaceous vegetation like grasses and sedges. Um, there's a lot of exposed soil that's letting the sediment run through and run off of the wetland. Um, it's not uptaking as much nutrients because there's less plants there. Um, it's pretty flat. It's, it's not really providing much uh, flood flow alteration because it's in the middle of a field. Um, so that's what, what I mean when I say it's a low, lower quality wetland. It's a wetland nonetheless, but um, like I said, it is the lower quality wetland and the lowest quality wetland on site. Do you have any vernal pools on the property? Yes, we had potential vernal pools, which we identified um, during the wetland site visit, mm -hmm. um, and those are included on the map. Um, and will they be protected? Um, there will be no direct impacts to any of the vernal pools, um, and we did call them potential vernal pools because yeah, by tell. yeah by the regular you know the there are no state regulations regarding vernal pools, but there are best management practices. Yep. And we go by um, a Massachusetts handbook that kind of tells you how to assess a vernal pool and what even is a vernal pool. And there's a list of obligate vernal pool species. That's what I look for when I'm assessing them. Are these species present? Are they breeding? Are they thriving? Or are they just dying? Um, and some of these are legitimately just ruts that yeah. wood frogs and salamanders think, oh, this is a good place to lay my eggs. Um, and you know, after five, six weeks, it's dried up maybe one or two metamorphose and get out of there in time, but the majority of them are dying. Um, the biggest vernal pools on site are in the central portion just south of the driveway crossing, and then in the 
northeast portion of the site. Um, we won't be anywhere near that one. Um, and the one in the central portion remains inundated year round, which means there's the potential for predators, including fish and um, turtles. So those, those animals that are laying their eggs there are really taking a chance to begin with. Um, I'm sure that there are animals making it out of there, uh, making it to adulthood and coming back every year to breed there. But the majority of the vernal pools we found are legitimately you know, 30 square feet, mm -hmm. and it's in the middle of a farm field. <laughs> so, thank you. Mm -hmm. The original plans that they submitted for consideration, they did have a parking lot and a vernal pool, and I did suggest to them that they change that, which they did. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Jen, can we have the, the list? Thank you. <clears throat> Let me see what the list is. Thank you. Oh, is that too many? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so we have approximately four people on the list. Um, probably like 15 minutes to talk each or something. Um, first on the list is Michael Shaw, 29 King Court. Well, talk fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Shaw. I live on King Court with my wife and my puppy. We've been there for 35 years plus. I am a member of the Army Engineer Association, and I want to talk tonight about wetlands and runoff. And I'll first start with a statement. The inland and wetlands and watercourses of the state of Connecticut are an indispensable and irreplaceable but fragile natural resource, which is what citizens of the state and town have been endowed. The wetlands and watercourses are an interrelated web of nature essential to the adequate supply of surface and underground water, to hydraulic stability and control of flooding and erosion to the recharging and purification of groundwater, and to the existence of many forms of animal, aquatic, and plant life. Many inland wetlands and watercourses have been destroyed or are in danger of destruction because of unregulated use by reasons of disposition, filling, or removal of material, the diversion or obstruction of water flow, the erection of structures, and other uses, all of which have despoiled, polluted, and eliminated wetlands and watercourses. Such unregulated activity has had and will continue to have a significant adverse impact on the environment and ecology of a state and town in Connecticut, and has and will continue to imperil the quality of the environment, thus adversely affecting the ecological, scenic, historic, and recreational values and benefits for the states and its citizens now and forevermore. The preservation and protection of the wetlands and watercourses from random, unnecessary, undesirable, and unregulated uses, disturbance or destruction is in the public interest and is essential to the health, welfare, and safety of our citizens of this town. Uh, the function of natural wetlands can be classified by the ecosystem of benefits. One, flood control. Two, groundwater replenishment. Three, storm protection. Four is water purification. And I was glad someone brought up water purification because you got the rain washes the pollutants out of the air. The big parking lots are putting in cars leak oil. Uh, trucks and trailers going by, it's a lot of diesel and oil that's gonna leak out of those trucks for sure. So it's all gonna be added there. And they mentioned the roofs also and the paved parking lots. Right now, Mother Nature takes care of it all. And there are reservations of biodiversity. And I had a note on here about people that want to replicate uh, wetlands. And although attempts at wetland recreation have been promised, they have largely been unsuccessful. They all fall short, they all fall short replicating Mother Nature. There's no reason to believe, however, that filling and other encroachments in inland wetlands will not continue at its present rate. If the estimate of 1,200 to 1,500 acres per year of wetland encroachment in Connecticut is correct, this represents a 3 to 5 percent loss each year. At this rate, most inland wetlands in Connecticut will be negatively impacted in the next 25 years. I 
I'm going to go over to the map and I have uh, something to show you. Working now. You can hear me now. You have to, you have to leave it up so that the camera can get it. Oh, this is not mine. Okay. I have something to go. Oh, okay. This is something for Swedish. This is a topography of the area we're talking about. It's on the back of the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it's going to open a little bit. And we can watch it on there. They can see it now. On the TV. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, they talk about, uh, water mm -hmm. Sort of. They talk about water flow. Can maybe turn it a little bit because it's we're getting yeah, it. We're missing one little. There. We want to build it. Oh, there, there, there it goes. There it is. Good. They changed. You're, you're good. We're good. Saying you can't stand this part of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They changed the camera so we can yeah. see right. it now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a topographical map of the area. Okay. Route five. You have Corporate Road, Kings Court, Mullen Road, and Weymouth Road. There you go. And if you notice, there's unique topography in Enfield, the southern part of Enfield, like no other. Anything to the west of Route 5 falls into the Connecticut River by the Connecticut River watershed. Anything to the east of Route 5 falls into Boyens Brook, right down the bottom here. From the swampy area all the way down. You can see that the people at the bottom of uh, King Court are in wetlands. But that's okay. They, it's allowed to, uh, uh, homes, residential, are allowed in wetlands. The state can put a highway over wetlands and get away with it. This, uh, I saw a woman complaining that she had water running across Route 5. They put the school in there and they increased the water flow around her. But the state was allowed to put that school in wetlands, push the water off into that poor woman's yard, and that's what she's faced with. People at uh, the building down here, corporate, the original building that's down here, have protection of a nice wetland up here that keeps them dry. This is all forest over here. This is uphill here, and this is downhill here. So you got a little quirk, uh, quirk in the uh, topography there. So all the water is going to go east. All the water is going to go east because of the highlands here, the ridge. All the water goes east. That's why this is a swamp. This is protected. This is a federal federal uh, uh, floodplain, right out right off of Weymouth. Where's that? Well, where's all that water drain? Drains down to here. All the water when it rains comes east, comes east, comes east. That's why you have all this here. So where he says he's in a flat land, all the water flow in the area that's going to flow down here comes from all here. Because this is a ridge right here. And this is all downhill. And how, how we figure it out, it's 150. And it's about 187 to the top of the hill here. And right down, right about here where the uh, mulch people are, there's a low point on, on uh, Mullen Road. So really, they underestimate the amount of water that's going to flow through here. So for exhibits, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn over to this committee, the FEMA map, with a picture of all the water that's sitting there waiting to come down to Mullen Road. I looked at Google Earth, and this is a picture from space that actually shows 
the runoff on a heavy rainy day that runs across right where they're going to put the warehouse in. So this area here, this little powerful little wetland, is really wiped, wiped out right by that uh, where the building's going to go. On the other side of the building is the northern branch of Boyan's Brook. So it's more water in the, in the back of the building that they're saying. That's the actual northern branch of the Boyan's Brook that comes down. An overview of all the wetlands in that area that runs down. And believe it or not, they're all interconnected. Even though they're all uh, separate on here, they all drain down to what we're talking about. Either one side or the other side of that building they want to put in. That's where it goes. On the National Wetland Inventory is that little powerful little wetland that's down there. It's on the National Inventory. And I have a, a map here that shows the drainage from the whole area to Boyan's Brook. Shows all, everything from Oliver Road all the way down. It's all downhill. Very, very slight downhill, but it's all downhill. I have pictures of streams running through uh, woods. I have one that someone must have created something, changed something, because it's a, a stream bouncing off the leaves coming down a hill. That's how much water is in the area. And where it's going? south of their project. They're going to be blocking anything that comes down there. So I'll turn these in. I apologize not having copies for everybody, but I just put this together today. I wanted to uh, make, some? make sure you uh, do it. Yeah. Will you give us copies after? Thank you. Yep. And as far as uh, the office building, some wetlands, however, occur over slopes where they're associated with groundwater seeps. And I do have a uh, couple of pages out of the wetlands handbook for uh, State of Connecticut in cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wetlands. Shows a type of weeping, uh, seeping, sloping wetlands that appear from uh, King, Co uh, King Court, the beginning of it, and that little, remember that little crook I showed you? Comes right down there. It's, it's really an indentation in the land, and that flows right in there. That's what creates that little wetland at their office building. But the rest of King Court, uh, the, the front yards of, of the odd side of the street, the front yards of the even side of the street, and the backyards all bleed down. Southern and easterly bleed. Well, I'm just wondering what he uh, was saying at that meeting on the 11th, January 11th he had. A couple of things stood out for me, what he had said. Someone from the neighborhood asked, what time limit do we have when you start building this project? They were concerned about the time limit. He said, well, don't worry about it. This is a quote. Don't worry about it. We're not going to start anytime soon. And it depends whether, what, who, who comes into that project site. The warehouse could be bigger or smaller. The office building could be bigger or smaller. And to me, that is uh, someone going to build something to suit the tenant, not someone that's going to put a project in that he presented now. That's very important. The other, the other item was he said he had uh, did some landscaping and cleanup of the site, and he just did a stripping of all the vegetation. And he even stripped where uh, the wetland is, where the office building is going to go, whatever number that one is. I have two owls, nesting pair of owls, that sat across the street in a big tree for the last three years. Every night I take the dog out for a walk, I hear them hooting, hooting, hooting. When they stripped the land there, they were there a couple nights making all kinds of noise, and then they moved down the end of the street where there's still woods. So that's where they were feeding off of little rodents or whatever there. So just a ruining of the ecology there. For what reason, I don't know. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Were you happy that the owls moved or not happy? <laughs> I am not happy. I, don't think I enjoyed happy. them. I don't think he was happy. I enjoy all the wildlife in the neighborhood. Can we just have a copy we, we of what a, you, you have? Yeah, I can make sure they you have all the copies. Thank you. Um, next on the uh, that would like to speak is Linda Gr uh, Gary, Linda Gary, 32 King Court. Hi. State your name and address. Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Linda Gary. I live at 32 King Court with my family since April 9th, 1999. We love it there. Although I can appreciate the investment that DF Realty has made in this parcel of land, which is considered to be wetlands, he purchased this parcel of land knowing it was wetlands. And bottom line, wetlands should not be developed, regardless if it's considered to be low quality or high quality. It should not be developed. To echo some of Mike's comments, wetlands do, do have benefits and they do have purposes. Wetlands play a crucial role in the water supplies around the world. Marshes refuel groundwater supplies and control the flow of waters into streams, which is extremely valuable during periods of limited rainfall. These ecosystems are usually very high in nutrients, which can complete surface water with nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from runoff. However, the plants and the animals in these communities use the excess nutrients for growth. All wetlands provide a unique and diverse ecosystems to the multitude of organisms inhabitants that inhabit them. Wetland acreage has been decreasing greatly, and although there are laws in place to replenish these ecosystems, it takes hundreds, if not thousands, of years. I know you asked that question, Kevin. To become fully restored. Restoration is not possible at the rate in which these wetlands are being overhauled by builders and developers. Many wetlands are also the sources of carbon dioxide, which not only recently has been recognized for the role that they play in the carbon cycle and regulating global climate. Many scientists are concerned that even the replacement of the wetlands will not be effective enough to remove the pollutants out of the water supplies to the lakes, the streams, the brooks. Experts are also concerned that the new wetlands being developed will not be able to maintain the plant and the animal species that depend greatly on the wet life ecosystems. It's also remembered the impact on the quality of the water. Wetlands filter many of the toxic pollutants out of the water used by local residents. Much of the water supplied by the wetlands go to local streams, lakes, brooks, and then flows outward. I still have great, great concerns about the drainage of this proposed construction. Right now, we live on the decline of King Court. We do not have a basement, and there's a reason for that. My neighbors in the cul-de-sac live in flooded areas virtually almost year round. We were assured at the informational meeting on January 11th that the water will not be affecting King Court. It will be running southward. But that water needs to go somewhere. On the south side of King Court, you have other residents. You have other businesses. You even have a trailer park. You have a busy intersection of Route 5 and 140. That water needs to go somewhere. And lastly, the wildlife. As I watch a family of deer graze for weekend after weekend outside our window, outside my kitchen window, it makes me wonder what will happen to the wildlife. We're forcing them out of their habitats. Where are they going to go safely? And I use the word safely because we're pushing their habitats. We're stripping them of their food supply. We're putting them around a commercial development and Route 5 and 140. 
there's nowhere for them to go safely. So my final remarks to the members of the town council and committee, please take our voices and our concerns into consideration when making your decision of this project if it is to move, be moved to the next phase. Please consider the wetlands to be stripped of its valuable nutrients, its benefits, our ecosystems, the residences that our lives will be affected, the market value of our homes, the quality of our life, and also the wildlife that's being chased away. Your decision will have a direct impact not only on this generation, but also generations to come as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next person is, and I apologize, I'll probably get the name wrong, Ivan Rakamani? Yes, that was well. That was good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody on the town council. My name is Ivan Brackamonte, and I'm the commission. Um, I have a wetland commission, yes, not wetland. town council. What's that? The this wetland. is the wetland commission. I'm sorry, the wetland commission. commission. <laughs> Thank you. I stand there corrected. are a few former wetland commissioners currently on town council. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> um, uh, I live on 24 King Court. We moved in 2013 because we loved the established neighborhood that's there. It's a well-established neighborhood of friendly homes on a dead-end street. Well, we don't say dead-end. We say the cul-de-sac, even though it's not really there. Um, I'm going to echo what most of my neighbors have said because it is one of the beautiful things about it is that we had such a vast, we were enveloped by the wooded wetlands all around us and the nature and everything and it's just so beautiful and I can remember one time asking about a little parcel of land behind my neighbor's house at 26 King Court and the town told me that it wasn't up for purchase because the town needed to maintain green space valuable green space behind 26 it's probably a parcel of 75 by 75 square and I asked well what's on that property and they said nothing it's it's valuable green space. It, it's not up for sale. The town has to maintain it as just open green space for the town. And then I was dismayed to learn that all of a sudden we're getting <laughs> rid of all the wetlands, but the little parcel couldn't be sold because it's open green space behind 26 King Court. So it just seems, you know, it just seems so odd that such a big project is going into a, I don't know, it just seems like an oversized project for the area. It, it encumbers us. Uh, so um, I came late to this, uh, on board finding out about this meeting, but I, I just wanted to voice my uh, decision on behalf of Corby Lane, who unfortunately had a, cor a coughing fit here, and uh, just voice our opinion against the project. It's just way too big, and it just seems like there's other areas that could be and especially with that road going so close and just the size of, of, the, of that warehouse building to the right, uh, the eastmost building, it's just humongous, so close to the, it just seems like it's put right in the wetlands. And then on the left side, of course, that other building that's so close to the back of everybody's houses, I know they say a 100 foot buffer zone is minimum, but, I mean, we can hear the traffic from Route 5 and 140, you know, it's, it, it's so 100 feet with uh, four or 500 trucks going back and forth. And if they use those uh, air brakes, is it? I don't know what those brakes are. Uh, what is it? Yeah. So that just seems like an awful lot. It just seems like it, it, it's, it, it's too burdensome for that area. So uh, I'm in, in all, I'm inclined to save the wetlands either that or redo something with the project because it just seems so big for that area. It just seems oversized. And th thank you for everybody. I'll, thank I appreciate much. that time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person on the agenda is um, Tim Coffey. Hi, I'm Tim Coffey. I live at 23 King Court. I've been there about 25 years. 
Uh, Virginia, you had mentioned about any fill being brought in <coughs> to them before. In uh, approximately 18 months ago, they brought in at least 100 trailer loads and dumped it back by the, by the wetlands and spread it out back there. I didn't know if the town was aware of that or not. I assume the, pre the, current, I assume the current owners did that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we had that. Yeah, that came before this. It did already? Okay. And what about the sewer system out there? <clears throat> Is there one in place? They would put it in, but that's not, we don't do the back and forth, but yeah. yeah. Well, there's sewer lines out there now. I, I reported a leak there three years ago out in the middle of those woods. Something to consider. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? A gentleman? Yep. <laughs> State your name and address for the record. Sure. My name is Mark Fontaine. I'm uh, one of the principals of DF Realty. Just wanted to talk. Oh, sir, you. Oh, okay. It's not appropriate. You yeah, would get, come yeah. back at the end. Well, let you, me talk at the end. You're, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're part of the presentation, so you got to listen to all the public first. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. We'll have you talk after. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Karen McNally. I live at 24 Fairfield Road in Enfield, Connecticut. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, statements here about the, the, the people that have been talking. I live one street over from, well, actually, uh, Fairfield Road connects on to Oliver Road. And they were talking about the fact that some of this wetland water, it gravitates from that area over to their area. It seems like it's a long ways away. But they built one house, just one house, on um, Post, Post Office Road. Um, it's down from the corner of where Sparkle is, and there are ditches on both sides of, of Post Office Road that have now become almost like streams. They opened up a small waterway from um, the next street over from Post Office, which would be the Post Road, and it's, it, it went from a little stream to now something that's very, very wide. And recently, I'm not sure if it was the town that came through there and posted some property that's for sale, and it's already stated that it's been approved for uh, building house lots on. Since that one house went in there, the culverts on, on, the, on each side of Oliver Road are now filled with water. There is like a mini brook going from Oliver Road, or from Post Office Road, over to Oliver Road through the farm farm field areas, and we have ditches, a ditch out in the back of my road, 24 Fair, Fairfield Road, that is now starting to collect water. So this water is coming cross town from somewhere somehow, and um, you know just with one house being put in there, it it. it on the corner of where um, the, the man that wanted to build the, um, the swimming pool place, uh, the, there is now a pond there on the side of Sparkle. Mm -hmm. They took the White House down, the, mm -hmm. the old house, took that down. There's now a pond there. And uh, it, my question is, uh, I think it's maybe Sp Spazzarini's property. He wants to put in a whole bunch of houses down there, or he's already been approved to put houses in down there. I just want this water yeah. is going to gravitate from there and probably head their way. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just proves that you know, the water is going to travel somewhere. It's coming from somewhere. It's going to move somewhere. And it's already causing more devastation with one home. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. There was another person that wanted, sir?
Hello? Hi. Hello, my name is Paul Ruel. I live at 48 King Court. 48. You know where 48 is? Nope. <laughs> right in the water, at the bottom of the hill on the right-hand side. There's a lot of water, and we don't need no more water. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the neighbors up here, they told you the truth. And it, I'm at the bottom of the hill, and water doesn't go uphill. <laughs> we all know that. Sometimes I don't understand why we're told to recycle cans, bottles, sodas, glass, everything. Why can't we recycle used property that's already raped, I should say. This is virgin land. Swamps. And the lady before me, if, if there's bad water up there, and it's coming down there, and the way the maps, they said, the worst damage is gonna be at the bottom of the hill. Do we want another crack thing? Like, I'm sure you all know all about the correct situation, the water there. And um, I, I just can't see 250 tractor trailers in the backyard and, uh, and 510 passenger cars. That's quite a few vehicles. Is it competition with the auction, Route 5? I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, Maybe uh, jack my house up and put it on stilts. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? No. Nope. One more time. Anybody else that would want to speak? Okay. Sir? Thank you again. My name is Mark Fontaine. I'm one of the principals with uh, DF Realty. Um, um, I'm also one of the principals that owns the um, office building that came up um, that's just um, an abutter to this property. So I'm also an abutter on, under um, um, in a different ownership. I uh, wanted to just, uh, just address for the committee a few things. Um, one, the meeting we had with the residents. Um, that meeting was not done to circumvent any town um, public hearing. It was really done in, to have an, in good faith, to have an open, honest discussion with the residents after hearing some of their concerns at the first meeting, um, and, and really allowed them to get a close look at the plans, because a lot of them from, from sitting way back there had no idea what, you know, uh, what stuff was and what stu you know, uh, where it was. Um, there were about 25 to 30 people there, so there were quite a few. Um, the um, we basically listened, just showed them the maps, showed them where everything was, and then listened to their concerns. Went around the room and listened to their concerns. We've taken a lot of their concerns um, and comments to heart and have included them um, and taken them into consideration. One, we've had significantly beefed up the landscaping in the buffer buffer, uh, buffer areas. Um, we have included a fence um, along the uh, side of the road. There was a number of concerns about headlights. I think Jeff had mentioned it. Um, we, there was uh, one of the largest concerns that came from uh, probably a dozen people was about lighting. So we went back and made sure that we were, you know, going to specify um, the use of low impact lighting um, and, and limit any light pollution. So we did, you know, those were some of the things that we you know, tried to incorporate after having that meeting, and we'll say them on the record here. Um, the as far as the 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 one comment about the timing, the uh, our comment about the timing was in an answer to a question that was asked if if there was going to be any uh, breaking of soil this year, and our comment was that we didn't believe so. That we, you know we were a long way from you know that you know wetlands approval, zoning approval, site plan approval you know, and all the design that goes in between, we did not see that happening anywhere close to, you know, this year. So that was that comment. Um, and I still stand by that comment. I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think that that would be feasible. Um, as far as the comment on clearing, okay, and we brought it up at that meeting that we had 
right around the existing cul-de-sac that's been there for 25, 30 years. We had 25, 30 years of residents and surrounding people dumping stuff in and around that cul-de-sac. We cleared the brush right around that cul-de-sac and we took out three dumpsters of just trash. Washing machines, we found an abandoned car, tires, carpet, mattresses. There was all kinds of stuff and people had just been dumping there for years. Um, we actually closed it off a couple of years ago, uh, but that all that stuff had remained there. Um, none of that brush clearing was anywhere near any wetlands. It only surrounded the existing cul-de-sac. Um, no soil has been brought in, uh, nothing to that effect uh, has been done. And all of this has not happened recently, it happened last summer. Okay, the only other um, time we've cleared some brush is at the request of the soil scientist who couldn't get into the wetlands because of, uh, I think he had mentioned, the invasives and the, uh, the pricklers, so we had to cut a small path so he could get to them, uh, a place where the first soil scientist couldn't get to, which I think led to the increase in some of the wetlands. Um, you know, in, in all those cases, we've gone, I think, above and beyond to try and get the right people in there to give a proper delineation so that it would, in our experience, it's made these things easier. Um, and, you know, if you try to cut corners, it hasn't. Um, the, um, we had started this process and actually started talking um, to Roger and planning about this site over eight months ago. Okay, and uh, we've taken a lot of feedback um, and changed the site significantly um, that you may not be aware of. There was initially three buildings proposed and over 700,000 square feet. Um, at, you know, uh, at, at Roger's suggestion, we had trimmed it back significantly. We eliminated one of the buildings and we trimmed down the size uh, significantly. And I think as Roger mentioned, we had even covered one of the vernal pools at that point and, and with that third building and, and uh, uh, we took that out of there. So we have tried to, you know, work with the town and go through that. Um, the, um, in designing the site, I made sure and, 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 and working with our engineers to try and work around the wetlands, okay? As you can see, the, some of the driveways take turns in and around. Um, the crossing that goes through the brook, we've tried to use a, an existing farm crossing uh, so that it minimized uh, the impact. Um, and, uh, and, and the major wetland that's disturbed, as, as we've all heard, is, is, is the lowest quality wetland on site. And I know there's an argument about the value of that, but um, it, it, we did take that into consideration. Um, and, and I just wanted to note, over the last five years, um, uh, in the last five years, I think this, the Wetlands Committee has seen two other applications for this site. Not from us, um, but from the, the previous owner. Um, in both of those cases, the, um, the previous owner wanted to change the use and the zoning uh, of the site. Um, in both of those times, the town made it very clear that the, um, they did not see the, um, the future of that site changing. That, their, that the town's um, belief was that the site should be an industrial commercial zone doing exactly what we're proposing to do. And we went back to those, um, to those meetings and those comments at the time and we designed the site around that um, suggestion from the town. Um, and, and, and the town had made that very clear if you look back at the, at the videos and the comments uh, at the time. So I think we're being consistent with what the town has always said that the site should be and what this, this site has been zoned for a long, long time. Um, and um, um, just wanted to, to note that to the committee. Um, again, I think that um, um, we have um, taken a hard look at trying to minimize the impact on the site. There is over 100, about 130 acres on the site, so when we're looking at impacting the two and a half acres, I think if you look at it in, in its full context, um, that, that's uh, um, you know, a reasonable uh, request on our part. Um, and again, we look to work with the committee and, and do whatever we can to, um, to move this, the project forward. And, uh, and listen to your comments.
Does that conclude your team's presentation as well, Mark? Or uh, I believe so. Okay, so it's up to the commission then to determine whether you want to keep it open and give them the opportunity to submit additional information that you've talked about. And if so, you would continue the public hearing until the next meeting. I think I feel that uh, it would be beneficial to continue it one more meeting so that we can get everything that was brought up addressed and we can talk about it, talk about it at that meeting and That's hopefully I mean, not to close it, it yeah, yeah. cuz if we close it we won't be able to talk about it right so. <laughs> So you would need a motion then? Yeah. Okay, I move. She wants, she wants to. Oh. I just wanted to know if, if you had dates of whichever meetings you're talking about where the town suggested it be used as an industrial site? It's, it's zoned as an industrial site, and the town rejected the change in that zone and wanted to keep it that zone. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, could, uh, we could provide you that information. Okay, I move that we um, continue the application uh, till the next meeting public of hearing? Public the hearing. public hearing. Excuse me, I move that we continue the public hearing for the next meeting, February twentieth. I second. Roll call, please. Um, Donna. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Marie? Yes. And Kelly? Yes. And Marcy? Yes. Six in favor, motion passes. So we'll continue the public hearing to our next meeting of Tuesday, February 20th. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for speaking as well. We appreciate all the comments. Next on the well, next on our agenda, we would go back to I guess new business IW 588 Yankee you Casting. Come, Are they here? By the planning office any day. Well, folks, we still have a meeting going on. Yes. Yeah. Right. This gentleman is just asking how we would get further information, and I'm just saying the plans are available in the planning office. Okay. If he wants to come by any day uh, and look at the plans. Okay. Thank you. Okay, no, no, that's no, good. No. That's good. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't believe Yankee Casting is here. No, I don't. I don't know why that they're not here. So I guess we'll just a motion to table would be motion in order. To table and I, I move to table Yankee Casting to the next uh, meeting of February twentieth. I second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Table to the next meeting. Um, next on the agenda is applications to be received, and I don't believe we have any. No. And no determination of permit needs. Um, reports of officers and committees. Uh, oh, sir, sir. Sir. Uh, reports from any officers or committee members? No. None. Uh, do we have a report from the planning director? We'll get him back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Jen and Roger, do we have any reports from the planning directors? Um, no, not other than uh, I did provide you, which was the two questions about uh, the villages, and I provided you the report on an ERT question that was raised at the last meeting. Yes. We still didn't get a call back from the ERT coordinator, but I did provide you the information on Yes. Uh, for your consideration. Yeah. It didn't look like it'd be worth our effort. No, I, it, our recommendation was that you have substantial information on this. Um, and, you know, and it might be appropriate at another point in time on another piece of property that we had less information on. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, he, he did for the ERT. Mm -hmm. He ca gave us the information regarding. Regarding and the uh, audience. The audience yeah. won't know what you're talking about. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You have to say oh, what the yeah, subject yeah, yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. The question was uh, the rec the request from the conservation commission was uh, for the at the last meeting was for this this commission to consider. Uh, having an environmental review team um, study this site. Um, an environmental review team uh, would come in and uh, it's a whole team of, it used to be uh, state employees and conservation district employees, but with cutbacks now, basically they, they recruit qualified individuals, but they're volunteers. Uh, so they would have to put out a request and put together a team. They don't do as many as they used to do. Um, and um, they do a great job in terms of an extensive inventory on a site. Um, I do believe that the information that was gathered here by the two soil scientists and the other woman, uh, they did provide pretty extensive information to you. Um, so it's more you're evaluating that information uh, and making your judgment on it. It's not a question of um, lack of information at this point. Mm -hmm. So it was our recommendation as your staff that um, uh, if you were to do anything on this particular site, it would be a question of whether um, you were comfortable with the uh, really three wetland assessments that you received from the applicant and if you weren't and uh, you wanted to have but to do a whole environmental assessment I we we didn't think was necessary but it's your your call yeah, I, think, yeah, I, think. Yeah, I think we have enough yeah I just, was, just that was time. just clarification for the public so they'd know what you were speaking of. I wanted to be respectful of the Conservation mm -hmm. Commission's request and provide you the information, and I did give you the yep. website and all the information about yep. what an yep. ERT is. That was very interesting. Thank, yes, thank you. Okay. So. Okay. If there's nothing else, I move to adjourn. <laughs> that was second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meetings adjourned. Thank you.